Happy Halloween, everybody, and welcome to the Wednesday afternoon lecture. Delighted to see Spider-Man has joined us. <laughs> I'm a little nervous about this, but it's just another day at NIH. And uh, we're thrilled uh, to have a special presenter uh, today, uh, Sarah Teichman, who is going to speak to us about traveling through tissues one cell at a time focused in this area of remarkable advances that have happened in just the course of the last few years, which is in this area of single cell biology, an area that she is a international leader in. So I think you're in for a treat uh, to hear some of the things that are now possible as we are able with tissues, including human tissues, uh, to go beyond uh, analyzing chunks of tissue and trying to see what's happening on the average to what's happening in the unit of biology, which is the cell, one at a time. A pretty breathtaking opportunity. Dr. Teichman is currently the head of cellular genetics at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, as well as visiting group leader at EBI, uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. And uh, also, and this is interesting, director of research in the physics department at Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. So there must be an interesting story there about how all those titles came to be. Uh, she did her undergraduate and her PhD at Trinity College, University of Cambridge, and fairly quickly got into a pathway uh, towards independent uh, career where she has flourished, uh, again, in Cambridge for much of the last uh, 15 years until becoming, as I've just mentioned, uh, a leader at the Wellcome Sanger Institute uh, and at EBI. She has been recognized by a number of prizes, including the Lister Research Prize, the Colworth Medal of the Biochemical Society, the Crick Lecture of the Royal Society, the EMBO Gold Medal, and the Mary Lyons Award of the Genetics Society. And probably most importantly, she is a recipient recently of an NIH grant, the HubMap grant, which is the Human Biomolecular um, Atlas program, which you might hear a little bit about. But her role in the, in the idea of developing an atlas of all human cells is particularly prominently featured by her co-chairing with Aviv Regev of the Broad of the organizing committee of the Human Cell Atlas, and I suspect she will be telling you something about that. Her own research is focused particularly in the area of immunology, but I think we're going to hear about something uh, a little different than that uh, today about the placenta. A fun fact is that she, as a teenager, was an author of a novel called Teenage Detectives, which she wrote apparently with her co-author as her mother, and which I tried to understand, but it was in German, and my German's not so good. So we are fortunate to have somebody to come and talk to us about what's happening in single cell biology at this particularly uh, portentous moment. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Teichman. Thank you very much, uh, Francis, for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to say thank you to the single cell group and the immunology group for uh, nominating me and inviting me to come here, and for all of you for, for showing up here on Halloween, and especially Spider-Man. <laughs> I feel safe. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is a short introduction on kind of a, an overview of, of how I see cell atlas technologies and, and their, their development, their evolution. And then I'd like to give a vignette of uh, work from, from my group where we've drilled into a particular tissue. And um, it's, it's interesting from an immunology point of view, but also from um, a reproductive biology point of view, which is the, the maternal fetal interface. That's what you can see um, sort of in this little globe here where you've got the, the placenta meeting the decidua and forming this initial interface for transfer of nutrients. And of course, that's uh, the sort of archetypical immune interface because the maternal immune system is faced with the paternal alloantigens and, um, and, and, and yet has to tolerate them. So, so I'll, I'll go into that in the second part of my talk. And, and here you can see the human cells logo. Um, as, as Eric mentioned, it's a, that's a very exciting initiative um, and it's been an exciting journey with, with Aviv and all the, the, the um, really now over a thousand scientists who've joined this consortium, some of whom are here at NIH. Um, 
I spoke to Ron earlier and, and, and um, many others from around the world and uh, from many different disciplines, uh, many different areas of science, which makes it kind of such a pleasure and, and so fun to, to um, be involved in. And so the way you, uh, I really think about the human cell atlas is as a Google Maps for the human body. And this analogy kind of really took off right at the first meeting in, in London that we had at Wellcome in October 2016, where we, the press then jumped on this idea. But really what, it, what it's trying to say is that we'd like to get to um, a, a, a map of human tissues, human organs, human anatomy that's at the molecular and cellular level. And so that we can go from the kind of current, more coarse-grained view that we have of the sort of Google continents or Google countries to the Google street maps view. So this is my uh, a house in Cambridge. And, and, and this is really the level of resolution that we want to get to. And, and the way, the, the, the thing that's really catalyzed this and the way we want to get there is through the res one, one major technology has been really the resolution revolution that's taken place in genomics that I'm sure you're all aware of, which is the fact that we can now measure nucleic acids from the tiny amount of starting material that's inside single cells. And, um, and it's this single cell genomics, and in particular single cell transcriptomics, which has now become sort of so affordable and high throughput and, and large scale, that's, that's sort of sparked the imagination, I think, of the community and catalyzed this. And, and um, of course, as Francis said, the, the cells are really the, the units of, of, of biology. You know, the, the unit of information is, is the gene in a way, but the structural units are the cells. And, and they form um, in, a, you know, in, in their combination the tissues, the organs, and the organ systems. And so it's, it's this single cell resolution revolution where we can now go from um, the, the population view of where we required thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of cells to measure the transcriptome to where we can now decompose a tissue into the single cells and in an unbiased way characterize basically the, comprehensively the repertoire of cells in a tissue. And sort of historically, this, this, this timeline here that we assembled for, for, for a review kind of places the start here, sort of a, in, in, in 2009-2010, when Azim Sarani sequenced a, a handful of primordial germ cells. So Azim's lab is right down the road from us at the Gordon Institute in Cambridge. And, and I hasten to add, of course, this transcriptomics is built on you know, previous generations of single cell qPCR and there, there were even single cell microarray attempts and so on. Um, but in terms of really comprehensively sequencing transcriptomes, you know, these, 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 these publications are early examples. And then very quickly, many other techniques followed that innovated both from a, from a genomics protocol point of view, but also in terms of the cell capture methods, right? And so there's basically manual picking, then multi-well plates, robotics that, that um, uh, speed up the, 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 the multiplexing process, um, chips, microfluidic chips, microfluidic droplets, um, micro well plates, and then the split seek methods. And, and all of these methods have, have contributed together with the molecular biology um, and the genomics protocols to, to really take us over the past 10 years from a handful of cells to, to the realm of kind of millions of cells in a single experiment. And that's that exponential explosion is really exciting, you know, from a, from a genomics point of view, also for, for us kind of computational biologists, which is really my, my origin in terms of the, the data analysis methods that are now required. And so these, that, that single cell genomics, that revolution in genomics also goes hand in hand um, with, with other technologies that allow us to um, observe and measure cells in situ, sort of in their two- and three-dimensional um, home inside a tissue. And these techniques en encompass um, both, both in situ sequencing techniques, like spatial transcriptomics, physseq, um, and, and, and TIVA, and so on, and also um, imaging-based techniques, murfish, seekfish, and, and the, the mass cytometry techniques. And they differ in terms of um, the, the plexity, in other words, the, the number of genes that they can capture the number of cells that they can capture and the sort of field of view of the tissue that's covered in, in one go. Um, and, and I would say that these techniques are sort of probably slightly lagging behind the single cell techniques, but they're, they're catching up and, and it's a very exciting time also in terms of this uh, uh, the, um, developments in this area. 
and, and of course, it's the combination, really, of these techniques that will, um, that, that, that's going to be extremely powerful in understanding uh, cells in tissues, tissue architecture, and the, the, the composition of tissues in a quantitative way. So just to, I want to give you an example of, of recent computational work from ours where we've taken, just as an example, these spatial transcriptomics chip data where you've got um, the chips from, from Joachim Lundeberg uh, with, where you've, you've got sort of voxels of 100 micron diameter um, uh, features that are circular and that have a, a unique barcode where it's um, 96 by 96 on a four millimeter by four millimeter chip. And, and so you're basically sort of charting um, the, the, the transcriptomic landscape of that four millimeter by four millimeter tissue section in essentially a 100 micron resolution. Um, and, and then the, the question is, can we identify interesting genes, not in terms of taking, obviously, the 1,000 different transcriptomic libraries, but sort of saying in one go, can we computationally uh, analyze this landscape in, in terms of the, the, um, the, the genes that are varying spatially in an unbiased way? Can we sort of do the histology automatically? And basically, to that end, Valentin Svensson, who's a maths PhD student in my group, who's now moved to Caltech, we teamed up with Oli Stegler's group and developed spatial DE, which is a, a, based on spatial Gaussian process regression to identify the patterns of genes that have a... Um, a spatially distinct expression in, in, in space, and it could be using these chips, it could be using imaging modalities. It is completely general, and it also generalizes, I should say, to three dimensions and even four dimensions. This is uh, a, a general approach for identifying patterns that are you know, periodic, linear, um, and, and, uh, and, and repeating, and so on. Uh, and then we can take this one step further and kind of say, can we cluster these Gaussian processes to identify genes that have the same pattern in that space? And um, we can find optimal clusters in, in, in a speedy um, optimization approach where we then say, okay, here we have a, a group of 31 genes that have this uh, pattern in space. Here we've got a group of 28 genes that all co-occur in this way, 30 genes that co-occur in this way, and so on. And, um, what's, and, and so it's essentially sort of automatically identifying regions and identifying the, 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 ex, the molecular origin of those expression regions in the tissue. Now, the, the, um, you can probably see very quickly that we can combine that kind of information and computationally increase the resolution by taking single-cell RNA sequencing data of a matched sample and we can then impute basically the clusters from the single cell transcriptomics, the different cell states, into the, the, the voxels in, in this two-dimensional space and sort of say, okay, the best, um, we, we fit the best combination of cell states into this voxel and therefore we can predict that um, this 100 micron voxel consists of these different cell states. So we can essentially sort of sharpen that resolution computationally and what we can also do going forwards is in, in, in integrate computation of the h &E stain, which we can get down to, to, to single cell resolution. So basically sitting underneath this spatial transcriptomics chip, this is a, what you just saw was human skin, basically, uh, spatial and single cell data generated from my group in collaboration with others. And what you see here is a mouse gut. And you can see underneath is the h &E stain, which so the, the, micro, the, 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 the bright field microscopy image of the tissue and superimposed on top of it the fluorescent voxels of where the RNA is being picked up by the, the barcoded features on the chip. And so we can take the single cell data, the, the, the spatial um, data from the, the spatial transcriptomics libraries, and then also the, the morphological um, feature, the, 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 the cell's morphology within each 100 micron voxel. And so this is, this is basically the future is really exciting, I think, in integrating these different modalities um, and uh, in, in to the end, to the to the, the the purpose of cell atlasing essentially. So I mentioned this this international consortium, and and in fact I'm going to Boston tomorrow for the um, I think fourth or so meeting of this community. And and you can see this is a slide from March. And essentially, we're at double the number of scientists. I mentioned about a thousand, you know, from many different countries, all the different continents, and. Um, 
the way we're, so we've, we, we just talked about, or I've, I've talked with different people today about how we're going to achieve coverage of the tissues, how we're going to achieve unification of technologies, how we're going to essentially bring this together. And um, one of the ways that, that um, the, 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 the organizing committee and, and the, the Human Atlas team um, has, has moved forward to achieve a sort of coordination is to have a project registry, which I encourage all of you to join if you're interested. It, it's at www.humansartless.org slash join HCA. And you can register a project here where, where you're, you're pledging to the principles of the Human Cell Atlas and using relevant technologies to study tissues. And we have 22 registered. And given that there are 54 in the human body, you know, this is clearly not comprehensive, but it's a step you know, towards that aim. And, and um, we've been on this journey for sort of roughly two years now. And I'm optimistic that you know, we'll, we'll, we'll really achieve um, uh, progress towards, towards a human cell as of, of, of sort of the majority of tissues within the next, say, five to 10 year time frame. So, so I think that's, that's really promising and exciting. And so what I'd like to move on to now is the, um, the particular tissue that I mentioned, which is the maternal fetal interface. And I wanna emphasize that we're looking at this in, in early pregnancy in the first trimester. And this is, this is using human material from social terminations. Um, where we're charting that, that, uh, that very exciting remodeling of tissue architecture that takes place where the endometrium becomes vascularized and it becomes the decidua that then interfaces with the placenta to provide it with oxygen and nutrients. And so from an immunology point of view, the, the coexistence of the, the, the fetus, the embryo and fetus with the, with the maternal immune system, you know, has, has a lot of analogies um, to, to, to various scenarios that, are, that go beyond reproductive biology. One is transplantation, and the other is actually tumor immunology, so where the neoantigens in the tumor are, are either recognized or, or hide from the, the immune system. And so this, you know, clearly from a, a, a reproductive biology point of view, also in terms of our existence here, that early um, vascularization and remodeling of the, the the endometrium to become the decidua and interface with the placenta and though uh, um, uh, tolerate that those, the, uh, the, the, the foreign genome essentially is, is really interesting in terms of understanding the basic biology, understanding the, the implications for reproductive biology, but it's also the place where some of the early uh, molecules like PD-1, PD-L1 that are now used in tumor immunotherapy were first discovered. And, and so in terms of those mechanisms of tolerance um, that have implications for tumor immunity and um, transplantation tolerance, it's you know, an, a, a fascinating tissue. And so how does this, how does the, um, you know, what are some of the, the mechanisms that are known? They are basically that, that, the, um, that the trophoblast cells from the placenta, which, which are the, the fetal cells that are the combination of the maternal and the paternal genome, are basically hiding from the maternal immune system by downregulating HLA-A and HLA-B. These are the, the, the molecules that present the, our, our self-antigens to the immune system, to the T cells, and are involved in, in distinguishing self from non-self. So those two HLAs are downregulated in, uh, in the fetal extravillus trophoblast, the placental cells. HLA-C and HLA-G, this red and, and green, they're, they're, they're there, and HLA-G is actually a fetal-specific HLA. And these uh, receptors, or these, these ligands, are seen by maternal immune cells, by the macrophages and the, the, the decidual NK cells, so these are innate uh, cells on the maternal side, and um, are involved in, in um, the inflammation that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the tissue uh, remodeling, and, but also the, the immunomodulation. And so this is a, there has to be this really fine balance. I think you've, you've probably appreciated this already from the way I've described this, this process uh, so far, is that on the one hand, there has to be uh, inflammation, invasion of the extravillus trophoblast into the, into the decidua to say, okay, you need to remodel your arteries now. You need to remodel the blood supply to provide the blood supply to the, the embryo and the fetus. Um, you know, at the different stages, the embryo becomes the fetus at the different stages of development. But at the same time, <clears throat> that, that transformation of the, the arteries 
triggered by the trophoblast cells that invade into the decidua, into the endometrium, has to be balanced with immunomodulation so that the maternal immune cells support, uh, you know, support fetal growth and don't restrict it. And so just from, a, from, from the maternal side, this is this tissue that I've mentioned, the decidua, is really the pregnant state of the endometrium. And the, the remodeling of the, the, uh, and the vascularization really turns the endometrium into, into a, a somewhat different tissue that becomes much thicker and is called the decidua. And that's, that's essentially the maternal side of the placenta. So uh, it's known that, that that goes hand in hand uh, with, uh, through, with, with hormonal changes. And there's an increase in secretion from, from the glands and the decidua and, and an, uh, a vast expansion in NK cells and these innate immune cells. So let's take a look at this tissue um, in, a, in a sort of schematic way in a bit more detail. And this is really summarizing, this, this uh, slide is summarizing some things that are known, some things that we're discovering in this study. So on the top side, we have the, the fetal cells. You can see the placenta here in, with the, um, the, the pink cells that are villous cytotrophoblast cells, either the placental epithelial cells. And then the dark, these reddish pinkish cells are, uh, form this thin membrane where those, those precursor, those pink precursor cells have now fused to make giant multinucleated cells and form the, the outer layer of the placenta. And then the purple cells are, have differentiated and are budding off from the placenta and are the extravillous trophoblasts that I mentioned that basically undergo an epithelial to mesenchymal transition and invade into the decidua. And this is kind of the, the key point where, uh, you know, a cell with a different genome is meeting the, the host immune system, the maternal immune system. And you can see the way we've represented these is that the, the purple cells are migrating to this uh, uh, vessel, so the maternal blood supply, and are then triggering a, an expansion or remodeling of these vessels to create large spiral arteries that are, uh, that are um, providing the blood supply uh, to the, the fetal um, capillaries, the fetal uh, blood system uh, in, in, that you can see in here. And on, on the maternal side, you've then got secretory glands and also many, many uh, immune cells and stromal cells that are shown here that we'll dig into in more detail in a minute. Um, uh, on, on, the, on the fetal side, there are also interesting fibroblast populations and Hofbauer cells, which are the fetal macrophages and then the, the capillaries. So looking at the, the decidua, basically from a histology point of view, what's known kind of and, and can be appreciated basically morphologically under the microscope is that you've got two different layers. So this is the myometrum, which is the outer muscle layer, muscular kind of layer of the uterus, and then the decidua spongiosa and the decidua compacta. So this is a more loose uh, sort of structure with plump, large glands, and then decidual compacta, you've got sort of only tiny exhausted glands. And while this has been known from a, a you know, in terms of the microscopy and the morphology, that there's very little is known about the molecular and cellular differences between this, these different layers of the tissue. And, um, and then the, the placenta is basically on this side, so it's kind of going from outside to inside, if that makes sense, in the, in the structure. So the questions that I, that I want to ask here are, on the one, uh, you know, first of all, what are the cell types and cell states that are, that are in this tissue, that are at this maternal fetal interface? As I've mentioned, there's, in, this, in, this early, in these early stages, very little is known about the structure and the architecture of this tissue, and that's partly to do with tissue access. Um, but it just hasn't been very well studied in human. There's much more known in mouse, but the, the mouse is very different. Even at the protein level, there are differences in, in um, the syncytins, for instance, very basic things like the, the, the proteins that are responsible for the fusion of the syncytiotrophoblasts. There are differences on the immune side. So um, there's a real motivation to study the human system as opposed to the, the mouse model. And then the second question that I'll go on to is what are the cell-cell interactions that are involved in the crosstalk at, at, at the interface of these tissues? which is kind of the, arch you know, the, the sort of paradigm for tissue interface. And so the experimental design for the first part of my talk where we're asking actually what are the cells that are there is that we're taking the tissue, um, the, the, the placenta and the decidua, and then well, should I say we, that's sort of the royal we. It's a, a very talented postdoc in my group, Rosa Vento, who went up to Newcastle to the Human Developmental Biology Resource, which is a welcome and medical research council funded bio resource in the UK that has two centers, London and Newcastle. And um, we worked with a group that's right next to the, the operating theater, basically, and has a lab 
in the medical school there, and that's mostly for Hanifa's group. And, and Roser went up and learned how to, to dissect the placenta from the decidua, um, optimize tissue dissociation for, for both tissues, and then um, stain and sort the cells and profile them at a sort of broad brush level in terms of CD45 positive and negative cells, that's the immune and the non-immune compartment using kind of broad brush droplet single cell RNA sequencing with 10X genomics, and then drilling into detail into certain populations using um, robotic plate-based single cell RNA sequencing, which is the full length uh, transcriptomics. And that, that's relevant um, from two points of view. One point of view is that it gives us a much deeper resolution of the transcriptomic states of particular cell populations that we're interested in. And the other thing that, that's, that's really useful from the full length data, so one is, one is more depth and sensitivity in terms of the transcriptomics. And the, the other side of the equation is that it also, because it's full length, it allows us to assemble the antigen receptor sequences and track the clonality of the lymphocytes and also the, the, the Kier receptors. So that in the T cells, the, the T cell receptor and the Kier cells, the, the Kier receptors, which I'll explain a little bit in, in the next few slides. So if we get an overview of this data, then um, you, can, you can see this is an integrated clustering of about 12 donors, um, uh, placenta and decidua, decidua, and we can distinguish the, the, the maternal, uh, the, the, the decidual clusters here, the placental clusters here, and I just want to say very briefly here that, that, that there, as I mentioned before, there are populations encompassing both the immune cells as well as the, the, the epithelial cells on the, um, in, in the decidual glands on the maternal side and, and the trophoblast cells on the, on the placental side, and then also really interesting stromal populations, fibroblasts both from the placenta and the maternal. And, and um, I just want to draw your attention to a couple of, of, of different sort of highlights that, are, that I'll go into in more detail. One is these, these green clusters that are different decidual NK cell states, and so it's known that um, natural killer cells have a special personality, I'll say, in the decidua that's more tolerogenic than it is in other tissues in our body. Um, uh, and, and what we, we've done here is basically resolve those in a more fine-grained way than was possible before. And especially, you know, at, as, as I mentioned, in this early, at this early stage that, that's um, of, of pregnancy that hasn't been sort of accessed before in, in, in a huge level of detail. And um, the other populations that I'd like to point out are these gray and, and, and orange and yellow populations, which are all stromal cells, sort of um, perivascular and fibroblast populations on the maternal side that contribute to the tissue architecture. And I'll describe how they actually hold some of the clues as to the, um, the layers of the decidua, this layered tissue architecture. Um, OK, so how can we, we tell which cells are maternal and which cells are fetal? Well, we can partly tell from the, from the actual um, dissection, which is basically shows these turquoise cells are, are placental, the gray cells are decidual. But then what we've also got, uh, got, got ethics for was to sequence the whole genomes of, from, of, of the maternal side from maternal blood. And, and we also profiled maternal blood in parallel, I should say, with the placenta and decidua from all of the donors. And also the fetal whole genome from fetal eye. What that allows us to do is to map the genotypes, the maternal and the fetal genotypes, onto each single cell transcriptome so that we can tell in an unbiased way whether the origin of the cell is maternal or fetal. And that had some surprises in store for us because the, um, the um, um, you know, there are some cells that are, that are uh, you know, physically localized in the placental samples, like this turquoise island here, but then when we genotype them, we saw that they're maternal, then they, they're, that's why they're gray on this side. I don't know whether everybody can see it. And when we, when we dug into that, it turned out that those cells are maternal macrophages that are stuck to the placenta and are sort of pro, uh, essentially patrolling along that syncytiotrophoblast membrane. And so that's something that we wouldn't have known or intuited, basically, without having that unbiased genotyping, um, okay? And that's, that's basically a, a really talented computational postdoc called Rosa Vento, who did this work with, with Angela Su. So it was a great teamwork, basically, between wet lab and computational expertise working together. 
And on the, on the deciduous side, you can see up here, there are cells that are, um, it's, it's a bit hard to see, but there are cells here that are gray that then become turquoise on the genotyping from the whole genome sequence. And those are those purple invading um, extravillous trophoblast cells that are budding off from the placenta and invading into the decidua and triggering that, that remodeling of the tissue architecture and the vascularization. And so that, that we kind of expected, but you know, it's, it's, it's great to see it kind of in an, from an unbiased point of view that we can identify cells in that way. And um, in terms of the genetics, I've also mentioned that we did the, um, the full-length single-cell RNA sequencing where we used our plate-based robotic pipeline. And so this is using SmartSeq and, and plates so that we can drill into populations like the T-cell populations in detail and kind of zoom in and get a high-resolution view of their transcriptomes. And we did this for, for several of the cell populations. And what that allowed us to do was to... Um, to assess the clonality of different cell populations, um, uh, CD4 cells, on, uh, including regulatory T cells, and also CD8 T cells. And that sort of had some, some surprises in store for me. So I've worked a lot on CD4 T cells. And in the mouse, there are papers that basically are very, um, you know, emphasize the role of regulatory T cells extremely heavily. So I was really expecting these cells to, to, to be there at high frequency, Pro proliferative, possibly clonally expanded. Nobody really knows kind of whether that's the case or not. And um, when, we, when we compared the, um, essentially the, 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 the cell states and the clonality in the blood cells and the blood T cells to the decidual T cells, then what we saw was that actually um, the, the, the extent of clonal expansion isn't greater in the decidua um, compared to the blood for any of the populations except for CD8 T cells and some of the donors. And so, and, and also the, 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 the CD4 T cells and the T regs aren't present at particularly high frequency at this point in pregnancy. So I think their, their role may be important much, at much later stages to kind of when, when the tissue has been remodeled and things are kind of ticking along um, and, 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 and the, the, the immunomodulation is more important. But at this stage, they're not particularly uh, um, frequent, nor, nor are they clonally expanded when, when we use blood as a control. And I should also say that the blood allows us to identify which cells are tissue resident in an unbiased way. So instead of using markers of tissue residency, so whether immune cells are kind of circulating through this tissue just from the blood or whether they're actually living there kind of um, as their, you know, long-term home and adapting to the tissue microenvironment, we can determine that in an unbiased way by com computationally integrating the blood and the tissue and then, and then sort of subtracting the blood cells from the tissue, if you will. And what, what, what we saw was that it was only the, um, the TD, CD, CD8 T cells, this, this, this sort of population um, here that's expanded in, in the decidua, that's these red cells. And, and those are, um, those, those could be uh, CD8 T cells that are possibly, you know, responding to matern uh, paternal antigens, or they could be from something like a CMV infection, and they look quite exhausted in the sense that they've got PD1 um, receptors and so on. But uh, the, 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 that's for the CD8 specifically. For the killer T cells, the helper T cells, the CD4, and the regular T cells weren't particularly expanded. Okay, so um, using these techniques, what we get is essentially a sort of encyclopedia of cells. Right, we can, we can say, okay, there are these cells present in the tissue, three NK cell states that I'll go into in a bit more detail next, NK1, NK2, and NK3, um, that have different personalities in terms of what we can infer from their transcriptomes, different levels of uh, KIR receptors, which are the kind of canonical receptors that are present on natural killer cells. Um, we can see different uh, mononucleophagocyte populations, monocytes, those um, maternal macrophages that are, that are interesting, that are specific to the, um, to the placenta. As I mentioned, regulatory T cells, CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, um, possibly not, not so important at this point. We can see different glandular populations of the, the secretory glands, the epithelial cells in the, in the decidua, and these correspond, I'm not going to go into detail about the epithelial cells, but they correspond to di those different layers in the decidua that I mentioned, the decidua compacta and the decidua spongiosa. 
and then the different stromal populations, these different fibroblast populations on the decidual side. But then the second question that I asked was, what are the cell-cell interactions that are supporting fetal growth and avoiding fetal rejection? And again, I want to take a, a global perspective on this and, a, and a use unbiased methods for, for inferring cell-cell interactions um, you know, with my kind of passion for computational biology and also my, my, um, my interest in, in protein complexes. So can we use the, um, essentially, the central dogma to sort of say what we see at the transcriptomic level is going to translate to the protein level and what's present at the protein level, again, we can predict what's sitting inside on the cell surface and what's secreted from these cells, and then reconstruct the cell-cell communication that's taking place by, um, through secreted ligands or through um, sort of tethered receptor ligand interactions on the cell surface. And the reason that this is um, sort of non-trivial and, and that I wanted to, to dig into it a bit more is that particularly um, you know, in immunology, but also people who work in development or in signaling and so on, know that the, the families of receptors and ligands contain multiple subunits. And so you can have a very different, for instance, affinity of a receptor if you've got um, you know, a, a particular combination of alpha-beta chains uh, you know, of, 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 a, of a heterodimeric receptor or a combination where the same copy of, a, of an alpha chain is combined with a different second copy. So that combination is really important. So what we want is that we want the precise, we want to know the precise combination of chains of proteins that make a receptor complex that's specific for a given ligand, and conversely also their multi-subunit ligands. And so what we, what we um, did to this end was to curate protein complexes um, from, from databases, from the protein data bank, complexes of known three-dimensional structure, and so on and um, provide a sort of framework of what's known in the first place, kind of what's known. And, and, and then, you know, at some later point, we can, we can predict and infer pro protein cell-cell communication from, um, from, from receptor ligand complexes. But let's start with what's known. And so what Rosa and Miriana did was they rolled up their sleeves, curated um, proteins of known three-dimensional structure, databases, literature, and so on, and as assembled a, a knowledge framework of about 1,000 protein complexes and just kind of roughly, um, about half of them are binary, so one subunit for the receptor, one for the ligand, but the other half are multi-subunit, and that kind of points out a little bit what the value of, of, of doing this, this arduous work of, of curation. Then what we can do is take um, the expression of the, the receptor and ligand subunits and basically shuffle them and calculate p-values for inferring specific communication between cell states, between the clusters from the single cell RNA sequencing through these particular receptor ligand complexes. This is a completely general framework that could be used for bulk RNA sequencing if you have different <coughs> data sets or proteomics or whatever. We're using it for, for the single cell RNA sequencing data sets here. And um, of course, sort of, uh, um, we want to ask then what, what are the interactions between, for instance, those invading extravillous trophoblast cells and the, the maternal immune cells. And just to sort of say briefly where they're from, kind of starting from the, the placental side, these cells where I showed that we identify the same cell state in the placenta and the deciduous because it's really butting off from that interface as are the, the ones that are shown here where you've got the gray pathway that we, we identify as starting somewhere around here. So we think the progenitors may be somewhere around here. Um, from budding off from the pink, you know, from the, the, the precursors um, going through a differentiation and through this epithelial to mesenchymal transition where they then become migratory and really enter into the decidua, um, we can here predict the, the sort of continuum of, of cell states and the, the, the transcription factors and the regulatory cascade that's taking place cell intrinsically to make these cells uh, then bud off into the decidua. And these are the the cell states that you can see that, that, that then come uh, from the decidual that are HLAG high and, and proliferative. And then just to, just to sort of explain, on the other side, we have the trajectory going from the villous cytotrophoblast to the syncytiotrophoblast, which are these cells where we are capturing single cells because we're using the droplets and, and disaggregation. But we can tell that they're from that, that fused multinucleated membrane because they express the syncytins, which are the 
the, the proteins that make the, 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 that catalyze the fusion between the cells that are known to, um, to make the, the multinucleated membrane. Um, and, and the interesting story about those syncytins is that they're, they're derived from endogenous retrovirus that's different in primates versus rodents, for instance. Um, and so that's an interesting sort of evolutionary uh, you know, story and difference between primates and rodents. So the, the extravillus trophoblasts are invading. They're recruited to the, the, um, the, the vessels, the blood vessels, and um, there are ligands for them in the maternal deciduous cells, and they're important for, for tolerogenesis, for, for triggering tolerogenesis, <coughs> a tolerogenic environment, essentially, in the decidua. Okay, so, so for a minute, let's focus first on, on the villous cytotrophoblasts, which are the pink cells, and their interactions with the other cells inside the placenta, because we can apply cell phone and the prediction of cell-cell interactions to the deciduous side, but also within the placenta, which is, which is uh, a nice and kind of learn more about the, um, the interactions in that tissue, which is, again, not, not very well characterized. And so, for instance, we see that the villous cytotrophoblasts, we predict them to be interacting with the Hofbauer cells, the placental macrophages, through this EGFR-HBGF interaction. So that's this, each cell state is shown by a node here, and the uh, molecular interaction on this happening on the cell surface by the, the edges, and you can see here the, the molecular complementarity there. Equally, they're talking to, we predict that they're talking to, the, to um, one of the two fibroblast populations through NRP2 on the villous cytotrophoblast and PGF uh, ligand on the, on, the, on the fetal fibroblast cells in this way. So you can get the idea where we can kind of reconstruct these, these different cell-cell interactions in the placenta. Now, if we move to the, um, to the deciduous side, I mentioned that we saw those five different stromal populations in gray and orange, and they're shown here with their molecular fingerprint um, being along this, um, uh, along here, and the columns represent these different five states, which we're calling perivascular one and two, and stromal one, two, and three. They've got different markers in terms of um, um, uh, cell proliferation development um, and, and different and pericyte markers, which are the, the, the cells that stick around the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, are particularly prominent in this paravascular 1 population to some extent in the paravascular 2, um, where you've also got matrix metalloproteases involved in remodeling. And then the, the, these three stroma populations have, have a, uh, a quite a different signature in terms of... Um, uh, the, the stromal 2 and 3 having, for instance, growth factors being secreted, insulin growth factor binding proteins, and um, um, uh, the stromal 1, I should also say, is, is the only one that's acted too high of these three stromal populations. So if we, if we then try to understand these stromal populations in terms of where they sit, <coughs> this is sort of where the, the spatial distribution of cell populations comes in, and you can see that it's so important to understand is that we can see that that acta 2 high, the acta 2 high cells, which is the, this marker that's expressed in only one of these three stromal populations and also in the perivascular cells, we see that, that marker sitting around the vessels here, uh, um, but we also see it in the deciduous spongiosa, which is the outer layer of the uterus, but uh, of the, the, the decidua essentially, not in the, in the upper level that's contacting the placenta. And so if we want to home in and understand more precisely these three different interstitial stromal populations in the decidua, then we can t use multiplex fish with different um, RNA probes, RNA scope probes, to identify the difference between the acta 2 uh, population. And you can see here that that green marker is restricted to the decidua spongiosa, whereas the prolactin, the insulin growth factor binding protein, which are these um, you know, cell... Uh, signals to the, to the placenta, they're in that upper layer in the compacta, but not in the spongiosa, so they're close to the placenta. And so this is, this is basically saying these, the very fundamental building blocks of a tissue are expressed in a zonated manner. There are different populations in different layers, and they're doing different things. So there's one that's more <coughs> sort of contractile, and there's others that are, that are secreting these growth factors. And in fact, the, the, the um, stromal 3, we also see signatures of steroid biosynthesis. So the fibroblasts that are close to the placenta, I'm not showing it here, but we also see that there are metabolic pathways that are switched on that are contributing to, to tolerogenesis, we think, based on the enzymes that are present. 
And if we now want to um, uh, uh, look at the, the, the crosstalk at the protein level between the, the, the extravillous trophoblasts and, and the stroma populations, we can see that the perivascular cells that are sitting around the arteries are talking to the extravillous trophoblasts through these different um, collagen, integrin, uh, and these different receptors. And you can see the sort of um, many-to-many -many re relationships between receptors and ligands. And this is kind of where we think that that molecular crosstalk is happening that's triggering the remodeling of the, the vasculature. And <laughs> if we then go down to the, um, the stromal cells and um, the ones that are close to the placenta, I said that we think there's lots of evidence that they're actually involved in making this tolerogenic environment. I mentioned this, the, the steroid hormone biosynthesis. We can also see that there are receptors, CLEC2D and galactin, that are involved in, in um, tolerogenesis and signaling uh, to, the, to the NK cell populations, all three NK cell populations, through these receptor ligand interactions. So I hope the kind of representation is clear. And so that, <clears throat> that gives us more hints about how the fetal uh, extravillous trophoblasts are interacting with maternal NK cells, not just through these hla keyer interactions that are famous kind of in, because they've been identified as being key for a certain fraction of miscarriages where there's maternal, paternal incompatibility of these receptors, but also through these other interactions where the, the, um, that are involved in immunomodulation. And um, this, this LIL-RB molecule, I should also say from the human genetics point of view, is known to be important in terms of the, the, the greater success of second pregnancies versus first pregnancies. So it's thought that this, this molecule um, on the, on, that's expressed on maternal macrophages and also on maternal NK cells has a kind of tissue memory, basically, for, from, from uh, a first pregnancy. And so if we drill into then the, 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 those three NK cell populations that I mentioned, that we, that we can now finally um, sort of subcategorize and understand in more detail, then I just want to reassure you that we can uh, validate them at the protein level. This is by fax. And we can also use GIMSA staining to show that they actually have different morphologies. And that's quite, kind of was quite fascinating and surprising to me is that the, this NK1 population, we can, we can see from the transcriptome that they have more granzymes and <coughs> um, granulysin. But you can also actually see it in terms of the, 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 the morphology of the cells is that they're packed full of granules whereas the NK2 and NK3, NK3 is really completely devoid of them. And, and I, I said we, we can see perforin and granulysin and granzymes in the NK1, but not the NK2 and NK3, and this is at the protein level also with fax. And as I said, that, that correlates with this morphological differences that you can see um, microscopically. Another thing is NK cells, uh, natural killer cells, are known to have this um, unusual cure receptors on their cell surface, which, which bind HLA-C and HLA-G and, 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 and HLA-E. And they're, um, they, they, don't, they're, they don't recombine like the B cell receptor or the T cell receptor, but they're extremely polymorphic between us. So they're, they're, they're a large protein family that, that um, uh, has a lot of variation within the, the human population, and so much that it's actually difficult to assemble or to identify them from the, um, the RNA transcripts on their own. And so we worked, um, and this was, was work uh, by Angela Gonsalves, who mapped, um, who developed a kind of uh, uh, mapping approach using, using the um, ipd keyer database at the EBI um, to, to uh, uh, combine with haplotyping information that we developed by PCR haplotyping to identify whether particular receptors were there or were not there and to then assemble the reads and, and be able to quantify particular receptors. And these receptors are important because they have really different uh, properties in terms of activation, actually repression of NK cells. And, and um, importantly, sorry, the, the take home message is here that the, those three NK cell populations have really different profiles in terms of activating NK receptor expression, where the NK1 has, uh, has really high expression of these activating NK receptors, and NK2 and NK3 don't. And so the, the sort of personalities of the, these NK cell populations are really different. They're morphologically different. They're different at the protein level. And that's, um, that's, that's kind of a, a novel and surprising discovery that's also important for, for reproductive biology and reproductive medicine because there are 
therapies that are involved in depletion of NK cells to improve uh, sort of the, the hypothesis or the, the, the theory is to improve tolerance. And, and what we're showing here is that it's important to actually understand the differences between the NK substates, if that makes sense. So if we go back and use the cell phone framework, then we can also reconstruct um, the, the, the different cell-cell uh, uh, communications or predict the different cell-cell communication features between these different NK populations that I've just mentioned. And you can see here that, that um, the NK1, NK2, and NK3 have different, these are the receptor ligand interactions. And so in this matrix that may be slightly confusing, it's for computational biologists, it's very gratifying to see this kind of matrix view, but I appreciate that it's complex. But just to suffice it to say that the take home message here is that we're looking at the, the crosstalk that we predict between NK and extravillous trophoblast cells, NK2 and NK3. And you can see the pattern of these dots is different, which is telling us that in the three different columns, it's telling us that the, the receptor ligand interactions that we predict in terms of recruitment of the extravillous trophoblast, this is um, chemokines and, and, and their receptors, and immunomodulatory interactions, TGIT, PVR, um, PD-1, PD-L1, ENT-PD-1, ADOR-3, these, these, these tolerogenic interactions that are known from different contexts in biology are actually different for the three different NK cell populations. And we can look at this in a more kind of user-friendly sort of uh, visualization here where we show that the, this NK1 population you know, has particular um, expression and interaction with HLA-C and HLA-G, whereas this NK population, for instance, doesn't, but has other immunomodulatory interactions. And I just, so these are all, these interactions shown up here are all interactions where these natural killer cells are turned kind of from nasty to nice and are, and are prevented from actually killing the extravillous trophoblasts through these, these uh, um, binding, you know, in these receptor ligand complexes. This is what we predict and hypothesize from based on transcriptomics and integrating with what's known about protein-protein interactions. Um, there, there are also other interactions with the fibroblasts and immunomodulatory interactions that we're showing here, uh, TGIT PVR with, with fibroblast populations in the decidua. And, and also this NK cell has, there are also enzymatic um, immunomodulatory uh, pathways that we can predict based on, for instance, clearing of ATP, that's an inflammatory small molecule, through this enzyme on the cell surface that then uh, is picked up by um, fibroblasts and macrophages to, to turn cyclic MP into adenosine, which is sort of more tolerogenic signaling molecule. So this is this is just to show, um, you know, the, the 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 extent of the cell cell signaling, the the circuitry that's involved in immunomodulation that we can reconstruct and and interpret from the single cell transcriptomics, both using this unbiased statistical framework, cell phone, but also using um, kind of our intuition about uh, enzymatic um, uh, small molecule interactions and so on. So just to sort of summarize this story, um, the, the, the take home message is really that we, 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 we identify how the extravillous trophoblasts differentiate and, and the regulation of this epithelial to mesenchymal transition at, at, at a very fine level of granularity, a lot of detail, this, this pathway. We identify new NK cell states, these green uh, cell states here, and new fibroblast cell states. So the, 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 the humble kind of fibroblast is actually, turns out to be really important in understanding the layered architecture of this tissue, and they play important roles in both structurally but also in immunomodulation, fascinatingly. And, um, and we also, I haven't talked so much about the receptor ligand interactions in recruitment of the extravillous trophoblast to the NK cells and to the vessels. And so this is really the take-home message of what we've learned about m how mater m maternal uterine cells avoid fetal rejection is, is that we've learned a lot more about the cell composition of these tissues, and we've also learned about cell-cell communication and the, the novel functions of, e of these new tolerogenic and K populations and the stromal cells and how they work. And so I want to just finish off by thanking Rosa, whom I've mentioned, Mirjana, um, who's, who's a, a, a super talented computational postdoc, and this was really a dream team that, that ripped through this project in, in supersonic time in my lab. And I've mentioned Maz Hanifa's lab, with whom we worked very closely on this up in Newcastle, close to the Human Developmental Biology Resource. 
And, and also I want to say a big thank you to Ashley Moffat, who was really an intellectual partner in this work from the very beginning. She's an emeritus professor in the pathology department and is, was, um, has worked on NK cells in the uterus for decades. And also Mike Stubbington, Angela Gonzalez, and the funders, and happy Halloween. I'll take any questions. <laughs> A lot of data, a lot of interesting things to talk about. People are lining up at the microphones, as I ask you to do, because of the video watchers. Uh, so let's start right over here. John O'Shea. Can you, uh, I saw the little blue cell there that was making IL-10. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? And did the NK cells make IL-10? Uh, so those are macrophages, I think, um, actually. Yeah. Um, so they're not NK cells, no. But there, there are a lot of... Um, yeah, there are a lot of tolerogenic molecules on the NK cells that I mentioned. I mean, there's enzymes, but also receptors. And there are some regulatory T cells there. They're just not very frequent, which are also producing IL-10. Great. Over here. Okay. Uh, just to mention, you showed a couple of slides where you showed that the maternal T cell doesn't do any damage to the fetus, but having seen cases of maternal fetal transfusion, in the case where the fetus is a little bit immunosuppressed, you get a whopping or I haven't actually seen the real clinical sign, but I've seen photographs. You get a whopping graft-versus-host disease in the kid who's often misdiagnosed as nicthiosis, and then they go through a bunch of other stages until they figure out the kid is mildly immunosuppressed. So I, I would just point out that exception to the rule. And the mm -hmm. other thing is having done a bunch of fetal maternal uh, autopsies and the, the fetal placental, the placenta histology is quite tricky in the ones that die. You really never, unless you're at a really high level place. I was in Brooklyn at SUNY doing uh, fetal maternal autopsies uh, when the fetuses die and we really re never got to the root of what happened, but they often have infarcts and all kinds of other strange things going on, probably have to be investigated. But that would be helpful to be included in your atlas because the biggest question when you get an abortion or a spontaneous termination of pregnancy and the, and the pathologist gets a fetus and a placenta is trying to figure out what happened. So you yeah. can, you can so prevent I think, it. Um, I think that's a great point and I would love to, to get into the, the kind of pathological states. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is basically more saying, okay, what's the kind of healthy status quo? These are all social terminations kind of in six to 13 weeks, as I, as I mentioned. And, and um, you know, the, 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 you see these CD8 T cell expansions that I said, but they look quite exhausted. So they've got PD-1 on them and so on. Now, what, ha what happens when things go awry, I think is absolutely fascinating and would be great to compare to the, the reference yeah. that we've made here. And it's, so it's, a it's hard to, it, it, we, we're trying to reach out to access material like that, but we're, we're you know, very, very open and interested in collaborating on, on uh, pathological scenarios. Thank you very much. Yeah. Here. Hi. Um, I'm fascinated by this concept of seeing development as a self assembling 3D puzzle based on cell cell contact preferences. Uh, do you think that's a major driving force in all of development? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a framework, certainly, that, that we're, we're applying to all of our tissues now in, in development and, and, and in, in, yeah, in, in dynamic processes like this, but also in homeostasis, you know, the signaling is going on and there's a kind of dynamic homeostasis that happens with the immune system. Thank you. Yeah. Over here. So it was absolutely beautiful work. I was wondering if you could comment on the tendency we have to kind of lump, for example, in this case of multiple women, multiple placentas, multiple fetuses together, firstly in the biological variation mm. you kind of lose in that case. Mm. And then the variation that we're obviously now seeing as well between the different single cell techniques mm. and how those kind of two different types of variation are going to play into how we handle the data we see coming into the single cell atlas and how we're going to be able to interpret that data. Um, so I, I think it's a great question. I mean, what we're, you know, we have variation here in the sense that we have these different post-conception weeks. We are, this is a first pass, we're lumping everything together essentially. Um, because also I should say the previous, one of the previous questions was, um, you know, that you can't tell without having very detailed pathology precisely in, in the case of these, this material 
you know, whether a sample is from the deciduous basalis, which is right by the, by the implantation site, or whether it's further away. You know, you need very detailed pathology kind of knowledge. And so, there, you know, there's variation in time here. There's variation in, in space in a very detailed way. And there's donor-to-donor -donor variation. And this is really only the, a, a very first-pass rough cell atlas of, of this early developmental maternal fetal interface. I think there are all those dimensions that you're saying are yet to be discovered. In terms of the integration of different technologies, there are batch effects. They're challenging. Um, but I, I think that we are, the computational community is getting to grips with these things, um, you know, very quickly. And that's, that's um, the, the batch effect regression, I didn't go into that. I mean, we, we, we use logistic regression here to, to map the SmartSeq data into the droplet data. We've used graph-based batch effect regression methods and integration methods. And I think that, uh, you know, I'm optimistic that we can overcome these uh, technological differences through a lot of computational um, uh, approaches. Can I follow up with a slightly weedy part of that same question, which is yeah. the differences that one gets depending on what your dissociation protocol is? Because I think that mm. gets glossed over yeah, a lot so of the that's, time. Yeah, um, so uh, you know, that's a great point. That's also really important, I think. And, and, and um, I, again, I'm optimistic that, for instance, with the, the spatial techniques like the spatial transcriptomics that I mentioned, we'll have a very nice, uh, you know, on the one hand, better spatial re resolution, but on the other hand, there's also a built-in quality control for disaggregation then. So what I didn't talk about is in those skin samples that I showed where we have the single cell RNA-seq and the spatial transcriptomics, we can use, you know, regression, linear regression, just to map the single cell data into the, the, the spatial data, and we can then tell what the, the residual expression is that we see in the single cell that we don't see in the spatial, and we know then it's highly likely that that's an artifact of the disaggregation. Um, you know, conversely, if there are expression signatures that are in the spatial and not in the single cell, then, then we know that there are probably populations that have been lost. During the, so it's, it's the, the, the techniques inform each other. Yep. So just a technical question. Mm -hmm. uh, based on proteomic studies, it appears that uh, every cell type expresses products of maybe 7,000 or 8,000 genes, a different 7 or 8,000 for every cell type. How, does, how, do, how do your uh, highly, highly multiplexed droplet-based uh, uh, transcriptomes compare with regard to, to depth? Uh, how, how deep do you get in terms of gene depth? So, with, with so here, in this particular case, we're using the, I think, version yeah. 2, 10 x genomics. And it, we get between 1,000 and 3,000 genes per single cell. Now, if you, proteomics is obviously, you're, you're probably talking about sort of bulk proteomics. So if we then average or impute across a cluster, you know, that increases. For the SmartSeq, we do detect up to 6,000 genes per cell. So the, the full length kind of sensitive um, robotic micro -well plate protocol. That's really great. And that's yeah. why you're able to detect these ligand receptor interactions, I'm sure, because these are not abundant proteins, at least. Mm -hmm. Last question. Um, so for the NK cells, did you do comparisons with the blood? I know you, in, you did do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. And yeah. You know, are, which of the NK, these new NK populations it characterized? Oh, no, are, so these are all tissue resident, these three. Right, so and how do, they, how do they compare to the ones that are in the blood? And ah, do you think okay. these are proliferating in situ? You mm -hmm. know, how do the CURE things match up with the yeah. predicted um, paternal, you know, paternal, paternal HLAC and G. I mean, have you have you split this out into individual, mm. um, you know, fetal and maternal HLA or anything yet? Anyway, we can talk later. But it's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the the question about the the origin of those NK. So we looked at that and tried to infer are they coming from blood cells and so on. Um, I think that's a fascinating question. We tried to see what we can infer computationally for by comparing the blood and the tissue, and it's not, at least with all the methods that we've tried to crack this problem, I, I, would, I don't want to make a, a kind of statement uh, about that. It does look like there, there may be one that's coming from the blood and, and one that's a kind of precursor, but it's, um, yeah, it's hard to, 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 to sort of prove that origin of the cells. Well, fascinating presentation and a great discussion. If you want to continue the discussion with coffee and cookies and maybe Halloween candy, I don't know, let's uh, adjourn to the medical library. But please, let's thank Dr. Teichman again.